All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Brad Clark, the Director of Technology and Innovation at ATG USA. Um, what we're going to be covering today is some of the updates for BIMBOX. Uh, we're going to cover some of the updates to the newer models, but then we're also going to talk about um, some new releases that we have and a couple that are coming up. Uh, let me check chat. Um, okay, so I'm going to go, I'm just going to run through initially some of the <clears throat> different models, some of the changes on those, um, and then towards the end, we'll do Q&A. Um, and you guys can, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom too, to where if you guys want to make sure you don't forget any of your questions, you can go ahead and post them in Q&A. Uh, and then afterwards or towards the end, um, I'll kind of run through those too. So let me start by sharing. Okay, so probably the biggest one for BIMBOX, the newest release that we're gonna have. Um, we've been building a couple of them over the past couple of months, but we're upgrading from the Striker 3 over to the Striker 4. Now, some of the biggest changes on that is we've upgraded to the Intel 12th gen processors. So it's a i9 12900K. Um, we delid that processor and we overclock it to 5.2 gigahertz on all the performance cores. Um, we've also upgraded the RAM from DDR4 to the new DDR5. Um, it's, it's just a significantly faster type of system memory, but then it also gives us some, some room for growth in the systems too. Um, so what we like to do on the BIMBOX side of things with desktops is we really try to focus on maximizing performance and also giving people the opportunity to upgrade their systems in the long run. So we understand that, that companies are continuously growing all the time and they're getting bigger projects or more dense projects to where they end up maybe needing to upgrade from 32 gigs of RAM to 64 gigs or adding in some hard drives or even swapping out and upgrading their graphics cards. Um, we always provide enough flexibility in the systems to where anybody can come in and if they need to make those changes that it's a lot easier and more affordable than having to just completely replace components. Um, what we've seen performance-wise going from the Striker 3 to the Striker 4 um, in terms of Revit performance, um, and that, that applies to any other modeling software. So if you're in AutoCAD or Civil 3D, um, even 3D Studio Max, or, or even Vectorworks, um, we've seen about a 25% increase in performance from the Striker 3 to the Striker 4. Um, and that's even with... Uh, the, the, the clock speed for the Striker 3 was at 5.3 gigahertz, um, but these new 12th gen processors are, uh, they've made a lot of changes into them. And with that, the efficiency of the processors have, has gone up significantly. So even running at a slightly slower speed than what we did on the previous ones, we've seen a huge jump in performance. Um, the next one, the Osprey is, is relatively the same. Uh, we offer both 32 and 64 core options for those. These are geared more towards reality capture. Um, so if you're doing any point clouds, photogrammetry, you know, laser scanning, if you're doing heavy renderings um, on the CPU side of stuff, this is the kind of system that you'd wanna go to. Um, but it's, it's still on the same DDR4, um, AMD currently hasn't, released any processors that support DDR5. So we're at DDR4 um, and we're using those same graphics cards and hard drives that we do in the Striker 4 and Striker 3. Uh, next one is the updates to our slim line of laptops. So the slim line of laptops, uh, what we've changed is we've gone to the 12th generation processors uh, and we've seen not quite a 25% increase in performance over the 11th gens, but still a pretty significant boost in performance. Uh, and then we offer 
those in both a 3060 graphics card, but also have an option for a 3070 Ti graphics card. And I am, I am going to run through these relatively fast um, just to kind of hit the basics. And then what I expect towards the end is to have more, some more in-depth conversations about some of these systems. Uh, I'm actually going to come back to that. So our M17 has not changed yet. Um, we're looking towards maybe the end of this year or so to switching over to the 12th generation processors on those. Um, one of the problems we've seen with 12th gen processors, the desktop processors specifically, is they run significantly hotter than what the 11th gens did. Um, so putting them in a laptop chassis right now, we haven't really seen the performance benefits just because they end up getting thermally throttled on those. So we've held off and we've stuck with the 11th gens for now. Um, the next one that I want to touch on is a, a new product that we've released. Um, it's the slim 15 inch light for Bimbox. So this is very similar to the regular slim series. The biggest change that we have in this is it's a, it's a lower tier graphics card. So it's a 3050 Ti, it's a four gigabyte graphics card. Um, it's still a great, really strong graphics card. It's just geared for people that are more focused on, you know, the Revit and CAD use, um, and they're less focused on the visuals side of things. So not necessarily super great for Enscape or Lumion. Um, unless you're working on some smaller projects. But um, for, for bigger projects and everything, you're gonna wanna go to either the Slim or uh, the next series that I'm gonna talk about where you're gonna actually need a bigger graphics card to really get the performance you need for um, very 3D intense programs like Lumion and Enscape and even to an extent Synchro. And the new series that we're releasing here in a few weeks is the uh, Slim Pro series. Uh, let me come up here to these ones. So we offer these in both a 15 inch and 17 inch, uh, but we've upgraded on these, both the processors and the graphics cards. So we've actually gone with an i9 processor in these laptops. Um, it's 12th generation series. And we've also gone with the uh, RTX 3080 Ti graphics card. So in terms of a slim laptop, these are honestly some of the best systems that are on the market that offer portability plus performance. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody that's constantly on the go or has to bounce around from meeting to meeting all the time um, and can't really afford to be packing around the M17, you know, the heavier beast, laptop that Bimbox offers, this is a great solution for you. Um, it's performance wise, it's pretty close to being in the middle between the M17, the, you know, the big heavy one with the desktop processor and the slim series. Um, significantly better graphics card and the processor is a lot better as well. So this is a great option for people that are heavy on the Enscape, AR, VR, getting into Lumion, um, very graphic intense, or even just a power BIM user. Let's see, let me pull up chat real quick. For the new slims compared to the current slim, can you repeat the increased percentage of speed? Yeah, Sam, I'll get to, I'll get to those here in a few. Um, Joe, I think you raised your hand. Let me see if I can find you. Okay. Thanks, Brad. What's the difference, I guess, between the Beast and the Pro Series now? Like, what, what's the differentiators between both? Sure. Series? Sure. So the biggest difference is, and I get, I'm going to focus more on use case versus just comparing specs. Um, use case for the M17s, you know, the bigger, heavier Beasts. Those are going to be geared towards people who need to be mobile, but they're super heavy users. So if you're looking at people doing reality capture um, or any other really heavy workflows, I would even say like renderings. Um, if you're somebody that has to be mobile, but you're doing really heavy workflows like that, 
then you're going to want to go with the M17. The, the, the desktop processors versus the, you know, even if you take the i7 desktop processor and you compare it to the i9 mobile processor, there's not really a comparison between the two. The, the desktop processor is always going to be outperforming those mobile processors when it comes to those heavy workflows where you're doing, um, like I said, anything laser scanning or uh, um, getting into just any of those heavy workflows. So if it's, if it's multi-threaded very heavily to where it uses multiple cores at once, um, you're going to want something that has that higher clock speed like you see in the desktop processors. Um, but it's it's going to be in a mobile package versus going with the the mobile i9 series. So the the slim pros that have the i9 and the 3080 Ti, I would say that's going to be geared more towards people who are like heavy in Enscape or they're heavy in Revit, CAD, Civil 3D, but they're loading in point clouds, um, heavy with navigating through a lot of 3D environments. Um, it's not necessarily processing data, but it's having a more fluid experience on the 3D side of things. Um, all right, who, who has any questions so far on what we've covered? Nobody so far. So I'm gonna run back through those real quick and we'll kind of talk through use cases. on those. So the Striker 4 is really geared towards any type of 3D modeling. So if you're a, a BIM or VDC person, you're heavy into uh, Revit, Civil 3D, AutoCAD, um, even Inventor. This is going to be the best solution um, for anybody that's heavy into it and can stick with a desktop solution. Because um, I know that there's a lot of companies right now that are kind of shuffling either back and forth or they've adopted a um, either a hybrid work schedule or a work from home schedule to where people are kind of geared more towards the laptop side of things. But honestly, if you're working on bigger projects, uh, you're gonna want, if you can, stick with a desktop. You get significantly better performance out of a desktop than you do a laptop. Um, the longevity of the systems is significantly higher than being with a laptop where it's going in and out of people's bags. People may be spilling stuff on them. Um, it's just, it's gonna last you a lot longer and you're gonna get a better ROI on a desktop than you do a laptop. Um, the, the real key behind it, so anytime you're looking at getting a system, best thing to, to understand is what type of software you're using. And that's why I talk that if you're if you're using Revit, CAD, or Civil 3D, any typical 3D modeling softwares, for a majority of your workflows that you're doing, those programs are only going to utilize a single core out of your processor to do any of that work. So it doesn't really matter if you have four cores, eight cores, or 64 cores. All it's going to use is a single core to do a majority of those tasks. So what you really want to focus on performance wise is having a really high clock speed. Uh, and so that's why we are able to overclock the striker fours and get as much speed out of each of the cores as possible. And then on the flip side, what I kind of mentioned earlier on the Osprey is it's geared more towards the reality capture side of things. And that's because most of those programs, um, like if you're looking at register 360, or Ferrocene, um, or even Recap Pro, any of those are going to use any and every core on your processor that they have available. So if you're, if you're doing a lot of workflows and processes in that, you're gonna get a lot better performance and cut down significantly more time in your workflows 
by getting a system that has significantly higher core counts. Um, so that's why the 32 and 64 core options are available on the Ospreys. Um, I can give you guys an example on this. When I was working in the industry, um, we tested out the time it would take to register some laser scan files. Because at the time, the company I was with was using Striker systems. And we were looking at whether or not upgrading to the Osprey was going to be beneficial or not. So we took a laser scan data set and we ran it through register 360. And I think it took right around 13 hours. And then we had a 32 core Osprey system that we ran the same data set through. And it took right around three and a half, close to four hours on it. So it's a, it's a huge cut in the amount of time savings that you can get on these systems um, to quickly get a solid ROI on the system. So you're no longer having to you know, wait until the end of the day to try processing your data and hope that it's finished by the next morning when you go to work on it. Or if you started in the morning, you know, your whole day is eaten up with trying to process data. Um, now you can get significantly more done in a shorter period of time. For the Slim Series, um, Slim Series is, is a great setup for anybody that's doing you know, typical BIM work. Um, so similar to the Striker, but in a laptop form, um, most of the time it's when you're not in as big of projects. Um, so whether you're doing residential work or some small to mid-sized projects in terms of Revit, I would say if your projects, your Revit files, for example, that you're working on, if they're under a gig, this is a pretty solid solution for you. Um, and when I say a, a one gig file size, I mean the file that you're actually working on. Don't take into account any of the, the linked files that you have in there, because for the anytime files are linked in, it's not actually pulling in all of the data for it, it's just referencing a lot of that. So it, it's not gonna eat up as much of your resources. But great mobile option, um, it's, it's lightweight, it's portable. Um, it comes in either a 15 inch option or a 17 inch option. And the, the big, one of the big differences between Bimbox and a lot of the other laptops that are on the market is their cooling. So anytime you look at the performance of a laptop, you can look at spec sheets all day and you can compare specs, um, but really it's the performance on them is not gonna be apples to apples. Um, the biggest issue that you see with laptops is the cooling performance. So if you have a laptop um, from like any big box brand, you'll notice that a lot of them don't have a lot of airflow or vents on the system. Um, they choose to go with a more sleek, modern design um, that's more aesthetic than it is focused on performance. So with Binbox, we really try to focus on the performance of the systems and try to get as much airflow through it as possible. So you can see on the sides um, of the Binbox systems, there's, there's airflow on both sides and out the back on both sides of it. And then on the bottom, there's a massive intake on the bottom side of it. And that's to keep the components as cool as possible. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that the only way you're really going to get advertised speeds from an Intel processor or even close to those is if you have enough cooling. Because if the processors get over, say, 80 degrees Celsius for most systems, uh, what, it's, what the motherboard is going to do is it's going to tell the system, hey, I'm running way too hot. I can't pull this heat off fast enough. So it starts decreasing the power and the performance that's coming out of the processor. And so you get slower performance throughout the day. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will notice that every once in a while that, you know, after, you know, two or three hours or even towards the end of the day, you notice your system may be running a little bit slower or your fans are kicking on more. That's because it has a poor cooling solution um, for the work that you're doing. So if you can get a system that's more focused on providing better cooling, you're gonna get significantly better performance. Your fans will probably kick on less um, and you're just gonna have a, a better experience for usability overall. Let's see, so we've got 
extra cooling stand. Um, I do actually. So I'll see if after the call, um, I can, I can send out some links. So I personally, I do use a cooling stand for my laptop, but I get a portable one. Um, it, it folds up really small, so it's really easy to pack around, but it only lifts the back of the system up maybe two or two and a half inches. Um, but it does. So pretty much every laptop out there actually pulls air, ambient air in from the bottom side of it, pulls it, flows it over all the components inside and then expels it either the, out, out the sides typically. Um, so if you can, anytime you can elevate the bottom of a laptop up off the ground, you're going to get a lot better airflow into the system uh, to help keep it cool. So yeah, any chance that you can use a cooling stand, I would recommend it. And that's why I, like a lot of times I'll travel around and I'll bring my um, my laptop stand. I was fan, but you... you can get the powered fans. Um, they, they do they do help. It, it really just comes down to personal preference and how you actually use your system. So. I mean, if you're somebody that doesn't really use a lot of external components and you can, um, I guess, afford to take up one of your USB ports to power it, then yeah, I mean, it's, it's gonna help more than just having static airflow trying to pull through and have the fans of the, of the computer itself try to pull things in. Uh, have any of the updates say the units allowed users to connect to and utilize touch screens and touch capabilities? Um, yes, Sean. So, so Sean asked the question, have any of the updates to any of the units allowed users to connect to and utilize in quotes, touch screens and touch capabilities to external screens? Yes. Uh, so we, Binbox currently does not have any touch screen solutions. Um, so none of the monitors, uh, or screens that are on the laptops are touch capable, um, but you can still connect either via Thunderbolt or USB-C, any external monitor that like a, like a Wacom tablet or a Wacom screen um, that has touch capabilities to actually utilize that. Um, I know I know a couple people that use Wacom screens, like they have the big 24 inch and I think there's a 32 inch option on those that have touch capabilities that you can plug into the bin boxes, both on the desktops and on the laptops. What other questions do you guys have for me? Um, and honestly, it can be about anything, either Bimbox or computer related to what you guys are doing. Thanks, Justin. No questions. Everybody knows everything. Uh, Windows 10 versus, uh, where is it? Okay, so David Bogle asked, Windows 10 versus Windows 11. Where is the AEC industry on this? Uh, honestly, it's kind of a wash from what I've seen being ordered. Um, we've got some people that are, are still sticking with Windows 10. Um, and a lot of times that comes down to the IT side of things where IT is wanting to stick with 10 for either security purposes or um, any of the imaging that they have pushed out to systems. Um, <laughs> you're still using 7 Pro, so you have to upgrade. Uh, personally, I would go to Windows 11. Um, it is not the same jump as going from like Windows XP to Vista or Vista to seven. It wasn't like a huge change. Yes, there's some of the um, the visual components have changed a little bit, but the back end for the most part is the same on Windows 10 versus Windows 11. Um, okay, sorry, I'm gonna try to read through some of these previous marketing things. Yep, uh, so Joe, yes. 
um, I can I can send these out to everybody. For so these are these are our spec sheets, our one page spec sheets for each of the systems. And yeah, I can attach these and get these sent out to anybody that attended the meeting. Uh, recommend laptop docking stations for dual 2K monitors. So Micah asked if there's a recommendation for a laptop docking station that supports dual 2K monitors. So the laptop docking station that I recommend for most people is actually a, um, it's a docking station that supports dual 4K monitors. And that way it just gives it flexibility for just about anybody that's, that's looking to upgrade. Um, there's another one that I recommend that also does three monitors. In fact, let me see if I can pull it up and I'll post it in the chat for you guys real quick. Um, it, so it's a pluggable dock. And I'll paste it in right there. So that's the dock that I recommend for people um, that are only using two monitors. Um, just because it, it connects via USB-C and it supports dual 4K monitors. Um, so, I mean, personally, it's a great solution. We've tested it on all of our systems and know that it works really well with them. Um, if you're looking for, let me grab this real quick, a triple monitor dock that also supports 4K. I'm gonna paste that in right there. Um, so I'm gonna run through the rest of these questions that are posted in, in chat real quick, and then I'll hit the people that are raising their hands as well. Uh, let's see, talking stations, some pro, because of IT, most laptops are never coming with. So Micah mentioned that they've been sticking to Windows 10 because of IT, but most laptops now are coming with Windows 11 pre-installed and it takes more deployment time to roll back to Windows 10. Correct. Um, so with Binbox, when you, if you're looking to order, we can choose between either Windows 10 Pro or Windows 11 Pro. Um, so if for some reason you need to stick with Windows 10, if you let your sales rep know that you need to stick with Windows 10, they can add that into the quote and we can make sure that systems are deployed with Windows 10 to cut down on the amount of time it's taking you guys to have to roll stuff back. Uh, Dennis asked what the current lead times are. So for all of the systems, desktops and laptops, it's about 10 business days to build. And then depending on where you're, you are in the country, it's anywhere from two to five business days. Um, and we all, we are also shipping to Canada now. Um, let's see. Oh, really? I don't see like you just posted on the doc. Okay. Sorry, give me one second, guys. Let me pull, pull this over. Oh, that's why. Sorry, I added on panelists. Thanks, Justin. Okay, so let's, let me go back to participants. Attendees. Okay, so Chris, I'm gonna allow you to talk. So Chris, you had a question. So for electrical Revit, it takes a long time to process. You have a Dell Precision workstation. You're asking for improvement. Um, do you know what any of the specs are on your system? request for Not off the cuff, but uh, that's why I was. I guess you made the comment that number of cores wasn't that important, but it was more of the clock speed. And, Correct. Uh, so um, is there a way for us to take a file, you know, if we're dealing with a gig file and it takes, you know, a few hours to run, is there some way to run it on your machine and say it would be five minutes or it's 
say three seconds yeah, I've done, or whatever. I've done that before. Sure. I've okay. done that before. Um, um, let's see. Where are you located? Winston-Salem, North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay. Yep. Let me let me take a quick note for you. So it is. Yeah, so I'll, I'll have um, the account executive for North Carolina and Charleston, or sorry, North Carolina and South Carolina reach out to you. Okay. Um, and then we'll, her name is Kayla Hornbuckle, and we'll have her yep. reach out to you and we'll get that file from you. And then whatever Excellent. whatever it is you want us to actually run through, like the processes that you're doing, I can I can open up and run it and get you a okay. time on how long it's taken. Fantastic. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm gonna lower that Q and A. So Gregory Perry asks, what's the main difference between Binbox and custom built with similar parts? Good question. So if you're looking at like a striker four, and I mean, I can tell, I'll tell you all the components right now. So it's gonna be an i9 12900K. Uh, it's gonna have a 360 millimeter all-in-one water cooler. Uh, we use MSI Z690 motherboards. Uh, DDR5 RAM, anywhere from 32 to 128 gigs of RAM. Um, graphics cards, anywhere from a RTX 3060 Ti to a 3090 Ti. Um, power supply is a thousand watt, uh, Seasonic Focus power supply. And the hard drives are Western Digital Black SN850 drives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people can go and they can. I mean, you can build any system you want. Anybody can do this, whether it's for personal use or professional use. The biggest things that you're going to see is differences in performance. You're going to have a, a warranty on the system as well, plus support. Um, but the, the biggest thing is going to be, I would say, is the performance side of stuff. Um, so we overclock the systems to 5.2 gigahertz. So the base speed of the i9 12900Ks are, I think, 3.5 gigahertz, maybe 3.6. Um, and they will go up to 5.2 gigahertz. But that's only if the cooling um, allows that. So if it's getting thermally throttled, it's going to drop back down significantly. And I can tell you right now that with the 12th gen processors, they run extremely hot. And that's why we delid the processors. Um, that's the only way that we've been able to actually hit 5.2 gigahertz without running into any temperature issues when we run stress tests. Um, so when we first started doing tests with the Stryker 4, we would test, we started out testing with the overclocks and we started with a 360 millimeter radiator. Um, we tried three different ones. We went to a 420 millimeter cooler and then we went to a custom loop. And all of them, even running at five gigahertz, they would all thermally throttle within the first two minutes of running a stress test. Um, we get, so when we get our, our processors, they come in big trays of, I think it's 12 processors on a tray. Um, and what we had seen online was the, the, the IHS or the lid of the processor. So a, a, a processor lid is supposed to be as flat as possible because what you're doing is you're taking a, a, a cooler and you're trying to sandwich those two together to help dissipate heat. So the flatter both surfaces are, the more surface area you have to actually dissipate that heat. What we found with those, the 12th gen processors is they're no longer squares and they're more of a rectangle. And when they did that, there's actually, um, the lids are concave a bit. So what you get is when you put thermal paste or liquid metal on them, um, it tends to pool in the center and the, sorry, the thermal paste does not dissipate heat nearly as well as copper or direct contact with the IHS. Uh, so 
no matter what we did with the lid still being on, we couldn't get over five gigahertz. And that's even with a custom loop. But as soon as we removed that lid, uh, we were able to hit 5.2 gigahertz and we were staying at or around about 80 degrees Celsius. We were no longer hitting those 100 degrees Celsius temperatures. Um, and, and you, you, I would be hard pressed to see anybody that is building systems themselves hit overclock speeds anywhere near that, especially with stability. Um, so we spend a lot of time on dialing in the overclocks to make sure that not only do they perform really well, but they're extremely stable. Um, and that's just something that you won't really see with going with it, just a custom built system that you go on to PC part picker or Amazon or Newegg and just grab components and stick them, slap them together. Because when you think about it, we took uh, the, the Striker 3 that was an 11th gen processor. It was still overclocked to 5.3 gigahertz. And when you compare it to the Striker 4 that's overclocked, there's still a 25% performance gap in those. So when you take that into consideration, taking a 12th gen system that's not overclocked, that's running anywhere from 3.6 gigahertz to uh, let's say 4.4 4 to 4.6 gigahertz, it's gonna be an even bigger gap on the performance side of things. Um, so the, the ROI ultimately isn't gonna be anywhere as, as good. You're not gonna get the support, you're not gonna get the warranty side of things by doing a custom system all by yourself. Um, next question was, do large 4K monitors impact system performance and do large TVs impact performance? Um, for the most part, no. Um, especially if you're, so if you're talking about a desktop, no, it's not gonna really affect performance. Um, even if you're going to like an AK system, all it's really doing is pushing video out and it's relatively the same amount of, of pixels that it's getting pushed out. Even if you go from a 1080 to a, to a 4K system, um, the graphics cards now are so big and so powerful that switching to a 4K or even an 8K monitor, it's negligible differences in performance. Um, I, I'd be hard pressed to see anybody that is actually able to, to see a difference. I mean, if you're doing like gaming or something, you could maybe notice a couple frames difference, but really the human eye only notices uh, changes in frame rates between 30 and 60 frames per second. So, you know, when you're running 100 plus frames a second, you're never really gonna see the difference in performance on that. Um, okay, so Ernest Ray, his next question is, I'm currently about to make a request to department to the department for an upgrade of laptops for civil designers and surveyors. Looking to get a bin box, but out of the price range they will spend. My question has to do with requirements for running Autodesk package, Esri and so forth. We need to upgrade without going overboard getting approval if you need uh, to look at. Yep, so Ernest, um, Esri, Esri is really dependent on what you're doing inside Esri. Um, if you can, I don't think you've posted in the chat below. If you can post in the chat below and say your, preferably your company name and what state you're in, um, we can set up like a call with you to kind of discuss some of this in depth um, to talk about like what kind of options and what hardware specs would be best suited for what you guys are doing. Um, I always like prefer to hop on calls to really talk through what your guys' workflows are on systems because I don't want to either under spec or over spec a system for people. Terry. Perfect. Thanks, Ernest. Um, David, looking forward to follow up on this. Okay, so David had to take off. So David Sudath, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. He asked, uh, do y'all post RFO benchmark scores of your systems? So we haven't posted the scores, but I do have a spreadsheet that has all of them in them. Um, and it's got like a drop down, so you can select striker four, or like a slim laptop or the pro or the light version to get those. Um, the best way to get them I recommend is to, uh, like if you can do the same thing as Ernest, if you can say what state you're in, um, 
then I can at least go in and figure out who your account executive is, and then we can probably hop on a call, or we can just send that out to you um, to make sure that we know what it is that we're looking at so that if you're looking for, you know, striker four benchmarks or the laptops, um, we can send that out over to you. And then we can kind of talk through any potential performance differences that you would see based off what you're doing with, with Revit. Um, and then Chris Willems asked, is a dock station save on the laptop connection when you take the laptop home? It's laptops. Dock station save. Um, okay, awesome. Thanks, David. Does it save on the laptop connection, Chris? I'm not sure if you're if you're asking like do the setting like if you were to have two docks, one at home, one at work, and you have let's say two monitors plugged in at each location, and then you go and unplug your dock and you go to the next one. Is it going to save? where those screens are in relation to one another. It, it should if you have them plugged in the same way on the dock. So if your dock at work, you have your left monitor plugged in on the left side of your dock and the right monitor plugged in the right side of your dock, and then you plug your, your docking station back in, it should save that setup. Um, so I'm going to grab just a couple more notes. Well, what other questions do you guys have that I can help answer? What can I know? Uh, no hands raised, no questions. Cool. Uh, well, if you guys do end up having any more questions in the future, um, please reach out to ATG. Uh, we'll make sure that our account executives get in touch with you and you can always get a call set up with me to kind of talk through uh, your use cases, you know, what software you're using, what you're looking to get, whether it's laptops or desktops, to make sure we get the right system for what you guys are actually doing. Um, if you, uh, I'll be sure to get the, uh, the spec sheets sent out to everybody too on the email chain. Um, for everybody that attended today. Um, and I really appreciate everybody hopping on and attending today. Um, some great questions. I appreciate you guys all hopping on and kind of picking my brain to, to get the answers that you guys need. Um, what laptop has the power button on the right side? Um, one second, Chris, and I'll tell you. Uh, so I know the Pro Series have a laptop button on the right side. If you're talking on, when you're looking at the laptop and you have the screen open, um, that the button is at like the top right above the keyboard. I know our Pro Series does. So does our Slim Series, the 15s and 17s. Um, and I believe our M17s do as well. Um, I can take a quick look for you. So yeah, the, the Slim Pros, it's located right up here. Same thing with the M17, it's up here in the top right. Um, the Slim, so it's gonna be the either, if you have one already, it's gonna be the either the Slim 15 inch. Okay, so it's the M17. Um, let me find where that one actually is. So it's gonna be this one. So it's going to have, um, if you're ordering now or even like mid-June, you would get the 12th generation processor um, and have the option of either a 3060 graphics card or a 3070 Ti. And it does support Thunderbolt 
Um, and it's got a USB-C connection, HDMI port on the back. Oh, I see. You are right. Um, I'm gonna have to check on the 17 inches. Uh, so the ones that I have here that I just checked are the 15 inches and they're on the right hand side, right above the number pad. Um, so I'll check to see if the new 17s have the button in the top left or if it's in the top right. Perfect. Well, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, and like I said, if you have any other questions or anything, please reach out to your account executives at ATG. And um, if we need to, I'm always happy to hop on a call with people to help answer any questions or point people in the right directions that I can. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and check out some of the other content on our channel. 